All right, have a Bible, Luke chapter 19. It's going to be the text we'll be struggling with for probably the first hour. But we'll get, we'll hopefully see we, what we can accomplish. So just have that open, Luke chapter 19, and then we'll do a, hopefully, somewhat of a quick review. All right, we have a major problem that we're trying to work on. We've reduced the problem to a very simple phrase, and that is what? Justified by faith, judged according to works. All right, that's how we've reduced the phrase, and we've, try, we've been talking about it for a long time, and we've looked at... Uh, some possible solutions here, some possible solutions there. I posted uh, two sermons on the app, one from Southside Baptist and another one from a church in Dallas. And, you know, it, it's, it's frustrating when you, when you listen to another church handle the problem. They went from Romans 2, verse 1 to verse 16 in about 34 minutes and 75 seconds. And I, you know, I'm like, how, how, how can you go from... Right, exactly. Paul, Paul didn't actually mean it. Just move on, right. And he moved on, exactly, which, which just drives me crazy. It can't mean what it says. Can't mean. Because we don't believe that. And it's like, so we, we, it, we you know. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, well, wait a minute. And, and, even, and again, I've said it multiple times. Even if we get Paul off the hook. We still got all the other passages that make the same, so it doesn't it doesn't help. So it's just so frustrating to hear a church that big, and of course nobody obviously there cared that you know he went from verse one to verse sixteen in thirty four minutes. I mean, I'm like, how 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 is it humanly possible? Like you couldn't even summarize Romans two one through sixteen in thirty four minutes. There's too there's too many problems there. So um. So it's just it's just frustrating. So we're trying our best to come up with some solutions. And so what we're doing is we're looking at four views. All right. Remember one of those books that the four views books and we're going to work on them. We're still in view number one and we'll do a quick review of what we've covered so far. And I don't know. (laughs) Well, we'll see. This is just a difficult situation. But view number one. Does everybody remember what view number one is? All right, okay, good, yeah, and I'll, I'll read it again so everybody can hear it who listens online. Christians will be judged according to their works at the rewards judgment, but not at the final judgment. For this one to work, there's obviously one thing that's absolutely required, and that is what? Yeah, to have mul- multiple judgments, which is, is a possibility. There is a possibility for that, and that's okay. Um, there's some other things that are required. There's some other things that are required. What's the biggest problem with this view so far? Say that again. Right. Well, they, yeah. I, I get the, big, the biggest issue with this one is this. So make sure everybody understands. The biggest issue is if we can remove Christians from all judgments pertaining to works, Right? And we have them, or, or, uh, as far as salvation is concerned, and we can put Christians in a judgment where they're judged according to their works. If their works burn up, they're still saved, i.e. 1 Corinthians 3. The problem is the other judgments that are spoken of as judgment according to works seem to involve what? Some going to heaven and some going to hell. So if there's no believers there... Exactly. That's the biggest problem with this. First, like I said, I've said 1 Corinthians 3 is one of the best solutions. The only problem is it doesn't resolve, it doesn't resolve everything. But it gets us you know, 60% there, 70% there. But we, we have to see what we can do. So um, let's, let's review what, we're, and we're using the Four Views book. So we're going to let them make the case for this, and then we'll determine if we like it. The, these are the points they made, unless everyone remembers. So let's state the view again. Christians will be judged according to their works at the rewards judgment, but not at the final judgment. So just remind ourselves, the thing that's required for this view to even possibly work is you have to have multiple judgments. The problem with this is 
Yes, we have 1 Corinthians 3. Yes, we can put all believers there. But we got John chapter 5. We got Matthew. We got Romans. We got Revelation. That speaks of a judgment where it seems some will go to heaven and some will go to hell. So therefore, you have to have believers present. And those judgments uh, determine where you go. So that's one of the biggest issues. Here are some of the points they made so far in this book. Many Christians teach you have to persevere to be saved. All right? It is a common teaching within Christianity that you have to persevere in order to be saved. Right? Now, this is, there, there's different ways of phrasing it, but the, same, the idea goes something like this. If you are a Christian, you will persevere. And when they say persevere, that means persevere in what? Not just in believing, but in good works, right? So many Christians believe you have, not all Christians believe this, but many do. Now, the minute you say this, remember what happens. On one hand, we're, over here, we're saying, hey, you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. And then we turn around and say, however, you have to persevere in works, or you will not be saved, or you were never saved. Well, how can you be throwing in the alone if you turn around and say something is required? Does that make sense? But many Christians teach that. Now, some, the second thing, they, the point they made, some believe perseverance is for reward and not salvation. Some argue, yes, you have to persevere, but that only determines reward, not salvation. Others argue, no, 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 no. If you don't persevere, you lose it. Some believe if you don't persevere, you never had it. So there is no consensus. No consensus. And you get everyone from, it doesn't matter if you're Arminian, it doesn't matter if you're a Calvinist, you, you still have this perseverance idea showing up. Multiple scriptures seem to indicate belief is all that is required for eternal life. All right. Now remember the pass. The what? What did, does everybody remember? What the four view book, four views book did? They used the Gospel of John. Remember? Okay. And what was the biggest problem with how they used the Gospel of John? They only used the passages that seemed to indicate what? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever Believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's there. That is true. We have to deal with it. But then they left out John chapter 5 where Jesus says you're judged according to your works and those who do good and those who do evil. All right. Well, wait a minute. Um, How do you reconcile that? But it is true that there are multiple scriptures that seem to indicate what do you need to do to be saved? Believe. Now, if we say, if we throw in the word alone or only, well, that creates a problem for the judgment according to works. Does everybody understand that? So, so far, these are the points that the book has made. Let's make sure everybody understands this. They've made the fact that many Christians teach you have to persevere to be saved. However, some believe perseverance is for reward and not salvation. And then they point out multiple scriptures seem to indicate belief is all that is required for eternal life. Then they turn to Luke chapter 19. So what we're going to do is we're going to set aside the four views book. And we're going to work on Luke chapter 19. Now, my fir- the first red flag, Now we, ba- we barely got into this last week. So today we're going to spend a lot of time on this. My first problem with what they do is they use Luke chapter 19 and they look, they go from, uh, they start in verse 12 and I think they go to verse 15 is what they covered. Luke 19, 12 through 15. And everybody just look at that and what do you see in Luke 19, 12 through 15? A parable. Now what's the first problem? They're going to build an argument about a major doctrine. Judgment according to works, based off a parable. That is a no-no. That is a no-no. Okay, you cannot do that because because parables parables are just usually the parable is a story trying to get across what one point. It's not trying to 
to give you some. It's, there's one major point they're trying to make. It's not necessarily designed for, you know, hey, here's all of this. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to work on this as carefully as we can. We're going to think about it. Then this is what we'll do. We'll go to the four view book, right, and see what they try to do with the parable. And then we'll see if what they do with the parable is what we discovered, okay? But we're going to go through it slowly no matter how long it takes. So clearly we're, already ta- clearly we're already going a far different way than the sermons we posted on the app, right? Okay, uh, Southside Baptist covered this uh, 16 verses in 34 minutes, which is, you know, I still don't know how you can do Romans 2 that way. The church in Dallas went a little bit more in depth. But um, there's no way this problem can be resolved that way. And this, this, I mean, we've been working on this for now I don't know how long. feels like months, and we still don't have any good answers, but we're going to do our best. So if the book is going to use Luke 19, then it's our responsibility to work on it to the best of our ability. Now, we're going to do something the book doesn't do. They just started where? Verse 12. Of course, we're not going to play that game, right? We're going to go back to verse 1. Hey, right, everybody ready? Because I think, I, think I think the story that pr- precedes it poses its own problem. All right? Luke chapter 19. Everybody ready? Verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Stop right here. Okay. So, if you want to take some notes... And Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1, Jesus is on a journey, and he comes through where? Jericho. And we're introduced to the main character in the story. And who is the main character? Zacchaeus. Let's write down the things we learn about Zacchaeus. What's the first thing we learn about Zacchaeus in this story? Chief among the publicans. All right. Now, what does that tell you? Okay, so leader. Okay, one of the tax collectors. Okay, do what? The hated group, right? Publicans, the, these are not like, hey, everyone's going to be like, this is wonderful, right? Does, uh, does every translation say publicans or do some say tax collector? Okay, okay there you go. We get the idea. Tax collector, right? Now, the, why are the tax collectors such a hated group? They worked for Rome, and in some cases, what were they doing? According to most sources, as long as they got what Rome wanted, they could take above and beyond. So they were, they were seen as not being patriotic to their own people, that they were traitors, they were greedy, uh, they were ripping people off. There was a lot of negative things about them. And what, so he's a leader of this hated group, the tax collector, tax collectors, which are seen as not being very godly, right? And then what else do we learn about him? He's rich. Okay. He's rich. Now, being rich is not necessarily seen as an evil thing. However, the Bible does seem to indicate being rich poses some spiritual problems, right? It's easier to go through the eye of the needle, Right? Camel go through, then for a rich man to enter into heaven. The love of money is the root of, well, we can get through, through. The Bible seems to really indicate, hey, you can't serve God and mammon, right? There's, there's this major tension. So already when we see this guy, he's, we're introduced to kind of the bad guy in the, in the, in the narrative. Agreed? He's like, ooh, boo, tax club, boo, right? You're supposed to boo him at this point, okay? Now what happens? Verse 3 is somewhat shocking in the narrative. This is not what you would expect. And he sought to see Jesus, who, uh, uh, sought to see Jesus who he was, and could not for the pre- uh, press because he was lit, little of stature. All right? So, wait a minute. The, you know, boo, but he wants to see Jesus. However, he's got a physical problem, right? He's small, okay? Now, that's, that's the part that everyone focuses on for little kids in, in Sunday school, you know. I don't know, you know, now if we go back church fathers, then it turns into a whole analogy that, you know, it doesn't mean, it, 
it's symbolic of something other than, you know, okay, whatever. We're not going to get into all of the, the, that because that gets get crazy trying to figure out. But we get the basic idea, right? And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. Now, you could argue that there, you know, and, and I do understand it, it's, it's an interesting account, you know, because you got this leader who's a tax collector who's rich climbing up into a tree. It seems socially awkward or weird, like, you know, but it's demonstrating what? His desire, his his commitment to seeing Jesus, to seeing who he was. He, he's definitely interested in this Jesus. He's definitely, definitely want to under, wants to understand, all right? And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. All right, straightforward. All right, now what's the controversial part about this? If it's, just, if it's weird, if it's weird that Zacchaeus is up in a tree, it would be weird that this possibly Jew, Jew, Jewish Messiah, right, this, you know, teacher of Judaism would come along and look up and say, what? I'm going to your house. Because it would have been a no-no, right? It would have been like, whoa, what are you doing? That's, that's, that's a traitor. You don't go hang out with him. And, but Zacchaeus responds, and he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Verse 7, and when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. That lets you know that this is a controversial situation, all right? He's a sinner. Why are you going there? Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I... And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Wow. Now that's a big, as far as the narrative concerns, this is the major, you know, turning point, right? This is like, whoa, this is the, the shocking turn in the story. You're not expecting the, the chief of the publicans to all of a sudden go, hey, I'm going to start giving my money away. I'm going to restore to people. I'm going to, do, I'm going to make everything right. I'm going to give restitution to anyone I have wronged. No one is expecting that, right? If you're reading the narrative, then make sure you understand that this is the big shocking turn in the story, right? And what, how does Jesus respond in verse 9? And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, please note, not everyone agrees on how to interpret verse 9 and 10. Okay? Some will argue salvation came because of what Zacchaeus did. Others will argue what he did was proof of his salvation. So guess what? Everyone gets to make their own. <laughs> this is the frustrating thing. Is there anything in the text that 100% gives it away? If we just allow the text to speak for itself, what does it kind of indicate? That the text is speaking for itself. It, there's definitely a, a, a adds to a hint that the reason he was saved is because of what he did. Definitely kind of leads to that. Now, interesting enough, interest. Do I'm sorry. Well, right, but I'm saying that that's you implying that. I'm saying if we just read the text, the text seems to indicate what Zacchaeus does something. Right now. You, now, you, now you are going to interpret that based off your presupposition on your, soter, your soteriology. If you believe, no, 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 this reveals that he was saved. Others would say, no, this is the reason for his salvation. This leads to the whole issue of works. Now, what is interesting, in the Four Views book, they're getting ready to use part of this to try to prove, hey, 
Salvation has nothing to do with works, right? Because Christians are going to be judged according to the works, not for salvation, but for reward. They just leave this story out. Okay? Got to love how Christians play their little games, right? Hey, we're about the Bible, but we're going to ignore the text that comes before it. Okay? You got to love that little game. So, that, that's the story that leads into this. Now, what happens? And as they heard these things, stop right there. You see that in verse 11? Now, this is critical. Why is this critical? Based off what just happened. He just told them this story, right? After hearing these things, what does he do? He added and spake a parable. Now, why would, so after all of this happened, after people witnessed what just happened, after they, they see and hear this whole situation with Zacchaeus, then Jesus decides to add and spake a parable. Now, is he adding a parable? Now, here's the thing. Because of what just happened? Is he adding a parable just because of something else? That, that, that's a lot of questions and how to, to deal with this, right? But immediately, listen, he's going to add a parable, and that parable is going to go from verse, uh, uh, basically verse 12 all the way to 27. All right? The Four Views book only wants us to read 12 to 15. All right? Now, immediately, wait, you're going to use this to try to prove a doctrinal point. That's not how you do Bible study. That's not how you do anything. That's not how you do it. Right? So we're going to have to figure this out. So you ready to break this parable down? All right, here we go. I'll give you some basic ways to handle this. All right? First of all, we're going to look at the reason for the parable. We're going to look at the reason for the parable. If you want to write the outline down. Second, we're going to look at the characters of the parable. And then we'll break it down after we get past those two things. We're going to look at the reason for the parable. And then we're going to look at the characters of the parable. All right. And now we'll break it down more as we proceed. It's trying to give you something to grab onto, and we'll go through this, okay? Everybody got this? All right. First thing we need to establish is what? Reason for the parable. And where do we see that? Verse 11. Okay? And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. Now, remember, right there, it, it's, it, it comes after this account with Zacchaeus, is he getting ready to add the parable because of that? Well, the text in, indicates maybe there's another reason. Look what he says. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they sought that, that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. And they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Stop right there. All right. He's nigh unto Jerusalem. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's getting close to Jerusalem. And he understands that the people have an expectation. And what is that expectation? The kingdom is going to appear, right? The kingdom of God should immediately appear. In other words, he understands that there's some there who seem to think that he's going to walk into Jerusalem and set up the kingdom. And so he's telling a parable in regards to that. Now, some believe that he is stating this parable because, and he's, he's, he tells a parable that relates to something that happened in history. All right? Let me remind you of what happened, all right? Because I think this is interesting. Many of the people who listened to him tell this parable probably connected it with an event in Jewish history that had occurred many years before. When Herod the Great died in 4 BC, he left Judah to his son Archelaus. Archelaus, is, I think is how you say his name. All right? So, that, now when he tells this parable, there's some there are going to be remembering the story. So let's go through this again. Herod the Great dies when? 
4 BC, this is according to at least one account, he left Judah to his son Archelaus, right, who had to go to Rome to have the inheritance approved. Not wanting Archelaus as their ruler, the Jews sent 50 men to argue their case before Augustus Caesar, who did ratify the inheritance without giving Archelaus the title of king. Now, some believe Jesus tells this story knowing that some will be able to relate this story to this event. Now, that's always speculation. It's always speculation. Typically what happens is someone reads this and goes, wait a minute, that sounds like something in history. I bet you that's the reason he did it. But do we know? No, probably not. So do we, does it really help us one way or the other understanding the parable? Probably not. So what do we need to take away from verse 11? That the reason he's telling the parable as explicitly stated is for what reason? He knows that there's people who expects him to walk into Jerusalem and do what? Set up a kingdom. And he wants to tell a story that's going to imply he's not going to set up the kingdom at this time. So that seems to be the main point. So does it have anything to do with what came before? It's on the hills of. But it seems the stated case, the stated reason is people are expecting him to walk in and set up a kingdom. Now, why is that critical? Well, because if it doesn't have anything to do with what happened with Zacchaeus, then we don't have to get into a whole debate. Wait, did Zacchaeus earn salvation by what he did or did what he did prove he has salvation? Because that would lead into an ongoing discussion about the whole judged according to works. If it doesn't really have anything to do with that, then that interpretation is irrelevant. If it does, then that interpretation would be critical. Does everybody see why I'm asking that question? So can we kind of... Can, can we probably agree that what the, that the account of Zacchaeus probably doesn't have a lot to do with this parable? What has to do with this parable is Jesus wants to use this parable to... What's the main point of the parable based on verse 11 then? Okay, he's not setting up a kingdom now. That seems to be the main principle. Now remember, the Four Views book wants to use this to prove what? The Christians, no, they want, to, they want to prove which point. Christians will be judged according to their works for reward, but not to determine salvation. That's the point they want to make. The point of the parable is what? Now, you already see a conflict? Already see the conflict? You got to let the text speak. Right? And that's why interesting. In, in the book, where did they start? This is the garbage Christians play. This is the absolute garbage that Christians play. It's, it's the same thing as the sermon that, we, that uh, Sarah was commenting on uh, from Romans 2, 1 through 16 that I played from Southside. I mean, well, well, hey, hey, it, Paul didn't really mean it. He said your judge according to works, but he didn't really mean it. Oh, so you know what Paul means? If Paul didn't mean it, then why did he write it? And if he didn't mean it, you're telling me he wrote it under the direction of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in order to, for me to now say he didn't mean it? What kind of, what is that? That's not how you handle a text of Scripture. If it's there, I would assume Paul meant it. <laughs> right? I, okay. Can you imagine how, hey, you know, Mr. Goodlet, Mr. Goodlet walks in one, one evening. He's like, you know, I'm sorry, been out somewhere, decided I got a girlfriend. And Miss Goodlet gets all upset. He's like, hey, you know, and she starts quoting scripture. He's like, well, Moses didn't really mean it. Who are we to say, like, that's not, that's not a, a hermeneutic. Okay. 
That's not an interpretive principle, okay? Does everybody understand that? That's not your solution out of a problem, okay? But it's got to be your solution when you're going to cover 16 verses in 34 minutes. You've got to come up with a quick solution, okay? Well, we're not going to play that game, all right? So what, so let's, we've set it up. So let's make sure, what is the reason for the parable? He knows he's walking into Jerusalem and people are going to expect a kingdom now. That's the purpose of the, ki- of the parable. Everybody got that? All right. Now, so any, any point, anything we derive from the parable outside of that is at best what? Questionable. At worst, it's what? Completely wrong. Does that make sense? They're going to make an argument that this parable teaches us how, the, how judgment works. I'm already having a hard time with their view. Now, now, make sure we understand. Their view could be right. They just need another person to argue for their view. This is a bad way to argue your view. All right? Does that, everybody got that? Okay, let's go through this. Now, who are the characters of the parable? Everybody ready? We have the nobleman. All right? We have the nobleman. Everybody see it in verse 12? And he said, therefore, a certain nobleman. Oh, look at that. Woo, isn't that difficult? So we have the nobleman. Who's the next thing we have? Ten servants. Very good. We have ten servants. And then who's the next group? The citizens. All right? Those are the main characters of the parable. Noblemen, ten servants, and citizens. Whenever you look at a parable, it's always important to break down the basic contents of it, okay? Remember, what's the, what's the hermeneutical principle I've, I've drilled into your head a million times? Observation, then interpretation, and then application. We've got to observe what's here. We've observed the reason, correct? Okay. Which is going to be critical in interpreting the parable. Now we've observed the characters in the parable okay so far so good yes okay now let's break this down all right you ready let's now break the parable down here we go so we that that, all of that we can call that introductory information on the parable to get us started now let's break the parable down itself what's the first thing we have in the parable first thing you have in the parable do i A nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Now make sure we understand, this is telling us, this is giving us a preview of what he's going to do. Right? So really, that just kind of tells us he's going to go into a far country, but we can call this nonlinear, right? Because it's going to tell us where he's going to go, but but in the next verse, he's not already gone into the far country, because what does he do in verse 13? He calls the ten servants to do something before he leaves. So the first thing we really have is what? He prepares to leave. The nobleman is going to prepare for his departure. He's going to prepare before he leaves. All right? And what is he, what is he, he's going to prepare to leave, but what is he, uh, what is he going to leave for? He is leaving to go into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and do what? And return. He's going to go somewhere to receive a kingdom, and then when he returns, the Im- implication he would be re- bringing what with him? The kingdom. Right? That, would that be the implication? So that gives us what he's going to do, but before he leaves, he has to prepare. Right? And so what does he do in his preparation? What are the steps he takes to prepare for his departure? Verse 13. He calls his ten servants. He calls the ten servants. And what does he do for the ten servants? He delivered them ten pounds. The NIV uses probably what? uh, Minas. M-I-N-A-S, right? Yeah, Minas, okay. Sometimes this is called the parable of the Minas. Sometimes it's called the parable of the pounds, okay? But he gives them ten pounds. Now, what is the most interesting thing to take from that fact?
What's the most interesting thing that you should observe from the fact that he gives all servants... How, first, how many servants? Ten. Ten. He gives them all ten. ten pounds. Here's the thing I want you to know. Whatever he gives them, whatever it's supposed to symbolize, if we even want to think it should symbolize something, that everyone is given the exact same. Right? In other words, this is not like some get this, some get this. Everyone's getting the exact same thing. This leads to lots of speculation on what this is or how we should interpret what this is. Now, immediately, let me ask you, is the point of the parable what he gives them? What's the point of the parable? He's not setting up the kingdom. And what's the implication? Because he's going to leave to receive a kingdom, and then he will return. So in the me, so what does he want them to understand? I'm not setting up now, but there's something you have to do while I am gone. And he's going to leave them something. But whatever he leaves them, everyone's getting the exact same thing. Agreed? Right? Now we could get into a whole speculation of what some think that is, but that's not the main point, all right? Now, what does he tell them to do? He gives them something, 10 pounds, and what does he tell them to do? Occupy, all right? Now, uh, does the NIV use the word occupy? Doesn't use the word occupy? Okay, well, the word occupy, uh, if we look up the Greek word, it carries this idea, you ready? To carry on as a banker, or trader. To carry on as a banker or trader. Now this gives some indication. He didn't just give them 10 pounds. He gave them 10 pounds to do what with? To, u- to use it as a banker or trader. How does the NIV states it? Put this money to work. He's giving them something and then they're supposed to do what with it? Use it. To be, to uh, use it to increase, use it to produce something more. All right? Now, what, everyone's given the same thing, and they're there to use it to produce something more. Now, some will turn this into a whole discussion about money. That's missing the point completely, right? Why? Well, because Jesus didn't leave and give us all the same amount of money. Everybody should say, Amen. So if we're going to make it, what, what did he leave us? If we're going to try to identify what he left us, what would it be? No. We can't use the Holy Spirit to get more. Okay. The gospel. You're going to say the gospel? Yeah, there we go. Or his word. The gospel. He gave us all the gospel. His message. And we're to use that to do what? To bring others in, all right, to do it. That's the, ba- that's the best, uh, if, but again, the point is not even trying to identify that, right? The point is what it, it, that he's leaving people behind, all right, so to, for a specific purpose, all right? So everybody got that? So we have the nobleman prepares to leave. He's, le- he's going to leave. It tells us first what he's going to go do. Then it gives us what he did to prepare, all right? Little kind of non-linear. Hey, he's going to go here. Wait, now here's, here's what he did to prepare. Okay, so far so good. All right. Now the next thing that occurs. All right. So the so we have the reason for the parable. We have the character of the parable. We have the nobleman prepares to leave. And what's the next thing we have that occurs? We have the citizens. Right. We have the citizens. And what do the citizens do? What could we call this? Okay, revolt or the citizens rebel. The citizens rebel. That's the next major point. The citizens rebel. And what do they do? But the citizens hated him. Right? Let's write down, let's describe what the citizens do. First thing they do, they hate. Who do they hate? The nobleman who's going away to receive a kingdom and come back. They don't like this. The, the, what, what, and you would say, well, why do they hate him? Well, they seem to understand he's going to come back. And if he's going to come back with a kingdom, <laughs> they don't want that. They hate him. Everybody see that? 
Okay, right. They hate him. Right? And so what do they do? Not only do they hate, what's the next thing they do? They sent a message after him. Now, why are they going to send a message? Because this indicates that they start hate, that they plan this after he has left. He prepares to leave. He gives the servants, ten servants, how many servants? Ten. Ten pounds. And then he leaves. He's going to go get the kingdom. Now, while he's over here receiving a kingdom, the citizens are like, hey, look, guys, he's going to come back at some point. Okay, I hate him. I hate his guts. Can't stand him. Don't want him here. Can't stand. We got to do something. Well, what do we do? Well, it's good to send a message now because now we don't have to confront him face to face, right? It's always good to do that, right? Yeah, that's how people work. Okay, so let's we'll send a message. And what, what does the message say? We will not have this man to reign over us. So, what three things do the citizens do? They hate him, they send a message, and what's included in the message? You're not going to rule over us. So, so basically, what are they saying? Don't come back. Don't come back. Now, make this very clear. This is very important. The book, the Four Views book, they're going to make a major distinction between citizens and servants. There is no doubt the text is definitely drawing a distinction. All right? Now we'll see what they do with this. All right? So far, so good? All right? Now, what happens in verse 15? The nobleman returns. That's your next major point. The nobleman returns. The nobleman returns. Oh, we got to hurry. We got to finish this parable. We got to finish this parable before this hour is up. All right? Now, what happens when he returns? Let's, let's break down what, what occurs. Okay? He returns with the kingdom. Okay? Everybody got that? He returns with the kingdom. That's pretty straightforward. Next, he commanded those servants to be called unto him. He calls all the servants to him. Who does he not call? Citizens at this point, he only calls his servants. Right? To whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. So here's the thing. He comes back with a kingdom. He calls all of his servants to, fight, to basically give an account with what, what, about what they have done with what he left them. He gave them 10 pounds. Now he wants to know what they have done with it. Everybody agree with that? Yes? No? Okay. All right. The, uh, okay, now, and so, so there we have the nobleman returns, right? Okay, he returns with the kingdom. He returns, he calls... His servants to give an account. Next, we have the, do I? No, next we have the servants and their account, right? They're going to give their account. The servants give an account. That's the next major point. Now, what's interesting about the servants giving an account? What's the thing that should just jump out at you in this parable? How many uh, servants did you start off with? How many give an account? Well, that's interesting. Why? Why? Now, here's the thing. See, this is where parables get you in trouble. Does it matter? On one hand, no, because what's the whole point? I'm leaving... You got things to do while I'm gone. Don't expect the kingdom now. The kingdom's not coming now. The kingdom's coming when I return. And when I return, what's going to be required of you? To give an account with what you have done. And now he's going to give us an example of some people who give an account, right? And he's choosing three. Agreed? So let's look at the, the servants give an account Example, and we'll call these three examples. Example number one. What's the first servant? What does he say? Then came first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. That one's been busy. 
right? He got 10, he gained 10. It did, uh, is that how? Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I miss, I miss print, print, uh, miss saying that. Ten servants, ten pounds, well, each got one pound. Thank you for clarifying that, thank you. All right, because I was saying each got ten pounds, okay? So he had one, and now what did he gain? Ten. All right, so there you go. All right, thank you for pointing that out. All right, so, so far, and it's numbers. You know, you know I'm going to mess it up. Okay. No, 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 it's not okay. That's, 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 yeah, it's never okay to get it wrong, okay? All right, so thank you. All right, so everybody got that? So he took his one, and he earned 10. So now that's a total of 11. Okay, good. All right, make sure we, we clarify that. All right, so we can say this about him. Well, what is said about him? Well, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful and very little, have thou authority over 10 cities. All right, this individual is rewarded. That's the key. He is rewarded for what he has done. He is rewarded for what he has done. No, now, you can say, well, wait a minute. And now this leads to all kinds of arguments and debates. Wait a minute. If Jesus comes back with a kingdom and I've done good, then I get authority over 10 cities in the millennial kingdom. And this starts all kinds of debate. You're missing the point of the parable. What's the point of the parable? When he comes back with his kingdom, whatever you've been given, in this case, one pound, everyone's been given one pound, but all still given the same, what should you have shown for it? You've done something with what you've been given. Amen? And if you do, reward. Please note, reward. This is why the book is using this. Reward. Nothing to do with salvation, but doing with Reward, keep that in mind, right? right? They're already servants there. That's the point they're going to make. All right, so there's example number one. He took his one pound, he gained 10 pounds, and then he's given authority over how many cities? 10. All right, you got 10, one, 10. So I'm, no wonder I'm getting the numbers all confused. Okay, all right, here we go. And the second example, he came and said, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. He did something. He gets five. He gets the authority over five. Again, what's the point? He's rewarded for what he has done. He is rewarded for what he has done. Reward. So far, so good. Yes? All right, now comes example number three. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an, an austere man. Th thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knowest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then uh, gavest not thou my money into bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? And he said unto him that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which thou shalt be given from him, that hath not, even that, that he hath shall be taken away from him. Stop right there. So what happens to this one? He's punished and he loses his pound. Right? True? One is rewarded. The other one loses. The only thing that happens to him is what? He loses his pound. That's the punishment, correct? Yes? He's referred to as a wicked servant, but he's still called a servant, All right? So the servants give an account. There are three, and, what, and what, what's example number one? One took their one pound and gained ten. The other one took their one pound and gained five, and the other one took their one pound and gained none. One is rewarded with authority over ten cities. One is rewarded with authority over five cities. And the third one is rewarded with 
nothing, they lose their pound. Right? So what's the, end, what's the uh, focus of the story? I'm going to go away. When I go away, you've got work to do. And when I return, you better have something to show for it. If you don't have something to show for it, you're going to lose even what you were given. All right? So far, so good? All right. Then what do we have? We have the citizens. We have the citizens are, I, I don't know how else to describe this, We'll say the citizens are judged. Okay, we'll call that the citizens are judged. What does the text say? Yep. But those mine enemies, which, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. What happens to the citizens? Killed. Now, would everyone agree there is a drastic difference between the way the servants are handled and the way the citizens are handled? Yes. All right? So, what would be the implication? Again, what's the main point of the story? I'm not saying in my kingdom, you've got work to do. But when I return, my servants will be handled one way, the citizens will be handled a different way. That is instrumental and becomes the foundational text for the point the first view tries to make. And what point are they going to try to... We'll read everything they have to say about the point, but their point goes like this. Christians are servants. You have some servants who are very faithful. And while Christ has gone to, re to receive a kingdom, they are busy. They're using what God has given them to build into the kingdom, to add to the kingdom. They're busy, and when Christ returns, they will receive a reward. Some, they're, they're half committed, right? They kind of do their part. And others do absolutely nothing. And they will lose what they have. Now, the reason they like this text is it sounds very much like what other passage what would you put as a cross-reference for this? 1 Corinthians. Everybody knows 1 Corinthians? Everybody knows the passage? Everybody can find it really quick? Chapter 3, I know Miss Gessler knows it. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll start in verse 11. All right? For other foundation can no man lay than, than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, uh, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Here's some kind of judgment of what's going to be judged. A man's work, Right? Now, these are people who are building on the found, that are built on the foundation of Christ. This would seem to imply that these are what kind of people? Christians, because you don't have lost people trying to build on the foundation of Christ. Agreed? Right? If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So the one who doesn't, of all, if one, all of his works burn up, he's still saved. They connect, these two they like. Now 1 Corinthians is better than the parable because 1 Corinthians isn't a parable. It's giving us an, an, a, a teaching about judgment. They're arguing that the parable builds upon this and, and, and supports this idea. So the parable, this is the way they would interpret the parable from a soteriological way. Right? This is the way it would be interpreted. You ready? We'll read what they have to say, but I'm going to paraphrase. Okay? It goes like this. We are servants. Christ right now has gone away to receive a kingdom. We have a responsibility right now to take what we have been given and to add to the kingdom. At some point, Christ will return with his kingdom. When he does, you're going to be called before him. And you're going to be judged according to your works. But it's not going to determine 
salvation, what it's going to determine is reward. And some of you are going to be the one with 10, right? You've made, you've earned 10, right? And you're, it's going to be like, good job, good job, reward. Some of you are going to be like, yeah, you know, I did, I, I kind of gave half, half, you know, I, I get a 50%, I'm doing good, right? And, and then some of you, nada, nothing, zilch, okay? And you're going to lose your reward. Now, what some Christians will say is, who cares, I still get heaven, I'm good. Right? which then demonstrates a really bad attitude, but that's not the point of the story, right? The point is not the story. The point, the point, the point of the story is not the attitude. The point of the story is what you produce. 1 Corinthians 3 comes along and seems to support the idea. Christ is going to return. All your works are going to be placed before him. Some will remain. Some are going to go... But 1 Corinthians gives you an assurance that what happens if all your work goes... You're going to be saved. That sounds good, right? This is, a, this is a possibly good solution, right? This is a possibly good solution. Now, the only problem is, the only problem we have so far with this is, one, you're using a parable, and I don't like that. However, the parable does find support in 1 Corinthians 3, which then gives me a little bit better feeling about the parable. The only issue we have with this view so far is what? That's the problem. If those other judgments mentioned, some people are going to be judged according to their works, and if they didn't do good, they're going to go to hell, we wouldn't have a problem. Because lost people can be judged according to their works, and they will go to hell because of their works. It's the fact that the text also seems to imply some will go to heaven. That's the biggest problem with this one. Now, we'll read what they have to do with it in the next hour. So does everybody understand the parable? Any questions about the parable? Uh, and make sure I clarify it very clear because I did misspeak. Okay, one pound given to ten servants each. Right? Okay, so every every servant got the same amount. They still got the same thing. I want to make sure I stress that. I stress that because this is not about well, some people got this and some people no. Everyone's given the same thing. Every servant. And is it a problem? Make sure we understand. Because some, from a, some will argue this. Well, he calls that one servant a wicked servant. Can a Christian be a wicked servant? That's how some will argue. Well, I, will, I, I think you can, we can find some examples um, in 1 Corinthians where Paul refers to the Corinthians as brethren and then refers to them as every name in the book. Carnal, okay, right? Children, ungodly, right? So there seems to be a case where you can be a Christian and be carnal, wicked, and that, does that make sense? Okay, I mean, we could go through a lot. I think the uh, book, when they, they're going to talk about that in the book, I think we'll, we'll see. All right, any other questions about the parable? Anything else confusing about the parable? Yes, no? So what's the practical implication that we can take from this? At best, we can take this. You're a Christian. You've been given something. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? Everyone here, and, and it seems to be very clear that everyone here is going to give an account. Now that right there, whatever, now make sure you understand. We got the theological question we can't quite answer yet. But that's a practical issue that everyone here must be concerned with. You're going to give an account. That's something we all have to at least be concerned with. All right? Now, we took, we took the parable apart far more than they did, but if they're going to try to use this to justify their position, we've got to take it apart. At, at best, we've confirmed that at least this idea corresponds with 1 Corinthians 3. Agreed? And do we agree that the text does seem to draw a massive distinction between servants and citizens? And, which one, and out of all of them, who are the only ones who are killed? Even though the one didn't do anything. Right? Now, right there, already seems to kind of go against the lordship idea, which says you got to do this, 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 this. And, that, and that, that's always the little flippant answer churches, all the sermons I've listened to on this. You know, 
you're not saved by your works, but your works will prove you're saved. Well, okay, well, wait a minute. If works prove that I'm saved, then this person, that last servant, wouldn't have been saved. The person in 1 Corinthians 3 wouldn't be saved. But I guess you don't need to really worry about what the Bible says to, to preach sermons in 2019. Just throw out nonsense and everybody's happy with it. But we're not going to be, we're not going to do that. We're going to figure this out to some level. All right. So what's view number one? What's view number one? Everybody state what view number one is. Christians will be judged according to their works at the rewards judgment, but not at the final judgment. The, be, the, argue, the, main, the, the centerpiece of their argument has been Luke chapter 19. We can confirm that the parable would at least give rise to that way of thinking. And we have 1 Corinthians 3 to at least support that idea. Does it resolve all the problems? No. Sometimes in theology, guess what you can do? Sometimes, or sometimes in theology, there's something, sometimes there's some, only one thing you can do, and that is find the best answer. You're not going to necessarily find the perfect answer. What ticks me off is when you listen to pastors preach and act like they just gave everyone a perfect answer. It's garbage because they don't want to raise up the difficult questions because they got 34 minutes to preach a sermon, so they're just going to make it simple. And, nobody, and they, they know nobody in the pew actually cares, so why not? But I don't care if you care. I care because we should care because it's God's word and we should try to find the truth. Sometimes all you can do is like, what's the best option? And you're like, well, your option has four problems. Okay, but your option has ten. Sometimes you have to choose the one with four over the one with ten. Does that make sense? All right. Okay. So at least we're, we're getting a little closer. Agreed? All right, and that's and, the, and view number one, I think, is Miss Gussler's view, right? You like this view? Yeah, Miss Gussler likes this view, and I've already told her I think this view is about at least sixty to seventy percent resolves the problem. I think it's it's one of the best. The others, I'm not so I'm not so good with. Okay, but this one is at least decent. So we'll see. All right, we'll stop. Oh, I wish we could have. Oh, we need more time. Time. I hate time. Time should not exist. Okay, I I, I renounce time. All right. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning. Lord, we thank you that your word is at least giving us some idea of a possible solution. We pray that we will not rest and we will not stop until we've examined every possible solution. And I pray that we will pick the one that is in most accordance with your word. And I pray that you will do our best to find that. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said...